in 2 Kings 18, and that is where we will pick up this evening. I appreciate Randy uh, covering last week for me while I was playing hooky a little bit. Um, and and uh, I see that Randy didn't get us far enough for me to finish tonight. It's all Randy's fault. Um, <laughs> are we going to finish the book? No, no. But we'll hit some of the high points as we try to round out the quarter. It's hard to believe another quarter is uh, done already. I, I don't know where the time goes sometimes. But as we bring it to an end tonight, at least our time together in this book, and, and part of how, why I've picked um, some of the spots that we're going to hit on our way to closing out this book, go back if you can in your mind, in your memory, way back three months ago when we started this quarter, kind of introduced the book, talked about what kings, remember, really, technically, first and second kings are one book. They were split into two for, for, for length when they were scrolls, but it's really one book. And so remember, as we close this out, all the way back to the beginning, what this book was for, the purpose this book seemed to have originally served when it was given. It wasn't meant to be, you know, kind of mashed up with chronicles, do a harmony of the history. It was a book with its own perspective. And the book's perspective was basically explaining to Jews, primarily in captivity. Remember, very end of 2 Kings 25, we talked about this way back then. That little epilogue, those final verses of chapter 25, or after Jerusalem is destroyed and God's wrath is poured out. Then there's this little hiccup of, a, of, a, of an epilogue, as it were, where Jehoiah Chin, uh, really Ken, I have no idea why I got translated th that way in Hebrew, but um, from Hebrew to English, but Jehoiah Chin, as we say it in good Texan, um, you know, it, that little blurb about after Nebuchadnezzar was dead and, and then the successor, and he was kind of elevated and, and ate at the king's table. By the way, records for which we have archaeologically, we actually have Jehoiachin mentioned in Babylonian records, and the ration that he did get from the king's table doesn't mean that he literally ate at the king's table. It means that the king provided for him there. And the whole reason is to give hope, and, and, the, and, and, and knowing that basically that, that, that coda would have been written about 562 there are hints on what's given there that that's about when it would have been written. That's right smack in the middle of the exile, right? You know, 586 is when Jerusalem is destroyed. Uh, Cyrus is decree 539. The Jews start going home 537, 536. So the 560s, about 562, give or take, right smack in the middle of the exile. What's the point of Kings? Number one, to explain how we got here. Because what do people typically want to do when bad things happen? Do we blame ourselves for our sins or do we blame God? correct answer is we blame God. And so Kings is meant to remind that generation in exile, how did you get here? Well, let me tell you the story. It starts with Solomon marrying foreign women, introducing idolatrous practices. Jeroboam took it up a notch. Many others took it up a notch. A couple of reforming kings here and there, but by and large, eventually even the house of David is absolutely corrupt with idolatry, among other things as well. And so God carries out faithfully his word. Because remember, God's faithful to his word, not just to bless. God is faithful to his word to judge. Remember, Moses, book of Deuteronomy, choose life. Moses warned the people. And Deuteronomy foretold that if they did not obey the words of this book of the covenant, what would happen? Then God would exile you. The land would vomit you out. You would be driven out. And so the fact of the matter is what Kings is saying is God was faithful, faithful to keep his word, not just for blessing, but for judgment. That's how you got here, because you broke what Deuteronomy said. And that's why you're here. But even in the midst of that judgment, that little, that little reminder about Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, um, in good Texan, um, that reminder is, even in the midst of God's judgment, is there still a slight glimmer of hope? And again, the correct answer is yes. Because even though Jerusalem is rubble and the temple is destroyed and the people are in exile, is the line of David still accounted for? Yes. And does God still have promises he has to keep to the line of David? He kept the promises through Moses about destruction for your sin and, and, and exile from the land. But does God still have promises he has to keep to the line of David yet? Yes, he does. And so what Kings ends with is, again, showing us how did we get here. That's what the book's about. This is why you're sitting in exile right now. But even in the midst of Babylonian captivity, there's still a glimmer of hope because we know we know where the Davidic line is. It's sitting right there with Jehoiachin, who's being taken care of by the Babylonians rather than being extinguished. And remember, that's one of the other things we saw this earlier in the book. I haven't made much of this for a while, but remember earlier in the quarter, one of the other subtle themes we noticed in the book was that sometimes tucked here and there through the text, 
Sometimes what happens is the text of Kings will add that God did not fully destroy or bring judgment because you know, he would leave a lamp for the house of David or some language like that. Where even as we're going through excuse me, going through Kings, even before we get to the final destruction of Jerusalem at the end of 2 Kings, God is always holding back a little bit because he owes David. He owes David an heir. He owes David a line. And even when it gets really, really bad, God still holds on to that son of David, even in captivity. We know where he's at. And so you know what happens when you open up Matthew's gospel and the genealogy of Jesus? Guess who's sitting there in the genealogy of Jesus? Jehoiachin. Why is he there? Because God was still keeping up with him. There was still a hope. There was still a house of David that existed, even if it was in exile. God was going to keep that promise too. And so that's what Kings is about, right? It's really about ultimately big picture. How did we get in this predicament? Well, basically everything that Deuteronomy said don't to do, we did it. And we didn't just do it. We kept doing it, and we kept doing it, and we kept on, you know, God kept on sending prophets, and God kept on sending prophets, and we didn't listen. That's how we got here. All right. So wanting to close that part of the book out tonight, why don't you go with me? I ask you to open to chapter, chapter 18. Um, two of the most familiar kings there at the end are, are the two kings who in some ways attempt to put the brakes on the disaster. Even in the house of David, most of the kings begin to become corrupt. Eventually, you even have, remember, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, you even have the house of Ahab, which is really the house of Omri, but you have Ahab's family intermarried in the house of David. Remember that through Athaliah? And so even, even the line of David has been corrupted with the great wickedness that has overtaken Israel. And we talked a lot through this court about the importance of marriage and family because kings makes a big deal about how marriage and family corrupt godliness. It um, goes all the way back to Solomon marrying a foreign wife. So, so strong refrain through the book. Not going to hit that anymore tonight, but remember that. So even the house of David's gotten corrupted. But there are two kings in particular late in the book that are kind of reforming kings, good men who try to put the brakes on this uh, kind of evolving disaster. Anybody remember their names? One was in chapter 18, so all you got to do is look down. Hezekiah is the first one. Who's the other one? Josiah, yes. Let's talk about those a couple minutes tonight. Because what's interesting about these guys is this. If everything I've just said, that's the big picture of the book. That's what this book as a whole is meant to communicate. Why did this happen? Why did God do this? How did we get to this point? And is there any hope left? Yes, there's a small glimmer of hope left. We need to look at these good men and figure out why their efforts didn't change anything. That makes sense? Why did their efforts not change anything? And, uh, and so let's look at Hezekiah here first for a minute, then we'll, then we'll go down and we'll look at Josiah. So I'm in chapter 18. I want to pick up, I want to pick up in verse 5. We're just going to again hit few, a few verses here, here, and there. So when we meet Hezekiah chapter 18, beginning of verse 5, uh, let's see if I can get my glasses to focus here. Um, it says of Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast, hear that language? He held fast to the Lord, and he did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And so the Lord was with him wherever he went, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him, and he was actually successful in that for a while with one of the great miracle stories of the Bible, right, which is the angel who strikes down the 185,000 troops of Sennacherib as a way of proving the point that God was with Hezekiah in this, and he was able to stand up against the Assyrians taking them over the way they'd already done with the northern kingdom. But the language in particular I want you to notice, verse 6, he held fast to the Lord. Keep your finger there and go back with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, we went back with Solomon, who was kind of the programmatic king and, and, and as the heir of David, should have kept things going, but instead becomes the guy who squanders what David has left to him by his love of women. And we think about Solomon as the temple builder. The problem is he was really the temple's builder. He didn't just build God's temple. What else did he build? Temples for lots of other foreign gods as well, because right, every wife has got a god. You got to make mama happy, and so uh, you got to keep your wife happy. And so he starts building other temples as well. We forget that he's really a temple plural builder, is what he is. Chapter eleven, verse two. When we kind of get to the end of um, the the summary um, of of Solomon's reign. Um, 
I'll actually I'll just start in verse 1 to make this sentence whole. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh. And so he, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And that's exactly what happened. It's the next sentence that's why we've come here. The next sentence. Solomon clung to these in love, and he had the 700 wives and the 300 concubines. He clung to these in love. In Hebrew, that's the same verb for what's said of Hezekiah, holding not to women, but holding to who? God. And so we're getting late in the book here, and so there's a contrast. Solomon didn't hold on to God in the final analysis. Who did he hold on to? He held on to the women, and that's reflected in the religion, the idolatry, the temple building, what have you. Hezekiah is different. Why has there been none like him up to this point? Because no one's held on to God up to this point like Hezekiah. There have been some other kings who were decent men. Take a Jehoshaphat or an Asa, something like that. But, but Hezekiah is of a completely different caliber. He holds to God like Solomon held to his women. And so some things become possible. That makes sense? You get that? All right. And so, and, and, and so we have Hezekiah. But here's the thing. Part of what seems to happen here at the end of the book is you have kind of a, the way the book began with you had, you had David kind of handing the kingdom off to Solomon and Solomon blows it. Hezekiah tries to reform and he hands it off to his son and his son blows it. What's his son's name? Manasseh. Yeah, some of you Bible students have been Bible students for a while. You hear that word Manasseh, you start shaking your head. Yeah. We're not talking about the tribe of Manasseh, son, Manasseh, son of Joseph. We're talking about the capital of Manasseh. How long did he reign? 55 years, half a century, half a century. In the, un, in the mysterious ways of God, why would God let a man like that have the longest reign of any of the sons of David? But he does. And just as David, a good man, hands off the kingdom to a son who reigns long and in prosperity and runs it into the ground, Manasseh does the same. Uh, but it's important to notice what's said about Manasseh. I'm in chapter 21 now, chapter 21, and I want to begin reading in verse 9, beginning in verse 9. We're going to read here for a little bit. Chapter 21, beginning in verse 9. Uh, actually, I said, I'll, I'll go, uh, well, yeah, I'll just stay there. But they did not listen, speaking of the people. And Manasseh led the people astray. And again, listen now to, in comparison to Hezekiah, there's been none like him up to this point. Now we get to Manasseh. And um, because Manasseh, king of Judah, oh, I'm, I'm in the wrong verse. There I am. Uh, verse 9. And Manasseh led them astray to do more evil. And here's where it gets really ominous. Listen to the text. Then the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. Now, why does that line matter? That's right. And, and it was a, literally a judgment on those people that they lost the land. Remember, going all the way back to Genesis, days of Abraham, when Abraham was trying to figure out God's timing and when, you know, uh, my descendants and the land and all this. And God says to Abraham, I think it's in Genesis 15, that the reason Abraham will not get the land now and immediately is because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so you begin to read this line in the days of Manasseh, and what do you begin to say? Uh, you know, God doesn't exactly tell us how and when he draws the line, but when he starts talking about you were worse than the people I kicked out of the land for you, and that's where Manasseh has taken them. Okay, so that's, that line's meant to, you know, if you're, you're reading the Bible across the books of the Old Testament, you're, you're getting the themes and the ideas and the language and the phrases. You see a phrase like that, you say, oh, this is getting serious. All right. And so the Lord said by his servants, the pro uh, yeah, I can read. And the Lord said by his servants, the prophets, listen now, because Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these abominations and has done things more evil than all that the Amorites did who were before him, and has made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, and the Bible, behold, is always a really good thing or a really bad thing. This takes it's a bad thing. Behold. 
I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the measuring line of Samaria and the plumb line of the house of Ahab, because that's where the house of David has now fallen under Manasseh. And I will wipe Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. Just like you do on the, on the cupboard or on the drying board when you're done washing the dishes at night. And I will forsake the remnant of my heritage and give them to the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. Because they have done what was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came out of Egypt, even to this day. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made due to the sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. All right. And so you have this, this strong condemnation of Manasseh. But I want you to notice something. Go back to verse 11, and, and I want you to notice an idea that we need to kind of chase for, for a moment here. Verse 11, um, because Manasseh has committed these abominations and done more evil than all the Amorites did who were before him, and has made Jerusalem or Judah to sin with his idols, therefore I am bringing disaster. So Manasseh has hit the point of no return is what God is saying. Literally, God will no longer offer the people repentance as a way of avoiding destruction. We finally crossed the red line. And the text underscores that the rest of the way. Chapter 23, look at verse 26. In chapter 23, even in the midst of Josiah's reforms, when Josiah attempts to put the brakes on everything, when he hears what the law says and realizes they violated it all and they're in deep trouble. Chapter 23 and verse 26. Still, the, oh, actually, let me go back a verse, verse 25. Before Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might. Now that, if you're reading, again, the Bible long term, you hear that phrase, what do you, what do you hear? Josiah turned to the Lord with all his heart and mind and strength. What's that? That's David, and even before David, what's that? It's Deuteronomy 6 and Moses. It's the greatest commandment. Josiah, the only king of whom this is said in the entire book, Josiah has turned to the Lord in the fully Deuteronomic way. And remember, again, going back to the beginning of the quarter, we talked about how this book is about especially how Deuteronomy is fulfilled in the downfall of Israel. So here's Josiah who has hit the heights of Deuteronomic piety in his relationship with God. The only one in this entire book, the only king described in these kind of terms, even Hezekiah didn't get this one. And yet look at what the text says. Keep reading. If I can find it again here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Still, the Lord did not turn from the burning anger of his great wrath by which his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. So from the, you know, from the depths of Manasseh of, of, of violating Deuteronomy to the point that even the Amorites were like, whoa, we don't, even we don't do that. If God's not going to judge you, he owes us an apology. Um, you know, you, you, you got monastic things there. Josiah goes to the opposite extreme of a piety unseen. And, and, and yet the text says, God says, my mind's already made up. We've gone too far. This has gone on long enough. And the level of evil that we explored with Manasseh cannot be propitiated by this point by any kind of restoration or return. Still have your Bible? Chapter 24. Chapter 24. Now Nebuchadnezzar shows up. The time for God's judgment is at hand. And so we, we, we start reading here in verse 24. Verse 3, Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight. Why? For the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done, and also for the innocent blood that he had shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord would not pardon So sometimes you get to a point where in one sense God won't forgive. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently so. Where the line has been crossed so thoroughly, and I think especially at the collective level, hearts are so hardened. Because here's the thing too, Josiah pulls out all the stops in, in, in his reforms, right? But what happens to Josiah's reforms as soon as he's dead, those of you who know the book? What happens, what, what do Josiah's sons do as soon as he's dead and they're on the thrones? And we run through a succession of them pretty quick. Right back to it. Because was the people's heart really changed? Jos Josiah's heart was good, but was the people's heart collectively, was it changed? No. And so as, as soon as Josiah is not there, what happens? 
right back to the line we've been on. But those are frightening words. It gets to the point when God says, I won't pardon this anymore. I'm done with this. You've crossed a line that should not be crossed. Have your Bible. Go with me to the book of Jeremiah. Actually, before we do Jeremiah, stay, with, stay in chapter 23. Let me look at one more thing in chapter 23, then we'll go to Jeremiah. And of course, Jeremiah was God's color commentator on the fall of Jerusalem, right? He was, he was God's prophet there in Jerusalem from Josiah's reign through the end and past the end to explain to the people, to remind the people why this is happening, that their only, that their only solution now is not repentance and, 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 and restoration. Their only, their only solution now is surrender to the Babylonians and accept the judgment. That's literally Jeremiah's message. That's one of the reasons he was so unpopular. He was literally saying to them, quit fighting, quit defending the homeland, surrender. This judgment is from God and it's irrevocable now. The only way you get right with God is by obeying him in the sense of surrendering. No more sacrifices, no more repentance is going to put this off. He is done with us in the land. And of course, people didn't want to do that. They resisted Nebuchadnezzar. Catastrophe resulted. But chapter 23, down in verse 24, I think, yeah. Um, Chapter 23, if I'm reading this right, verse 24. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums and the necromancers and the household gods and the idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might establish the words of the law that were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Before him there was no king like them. Okay, that's what we read. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, With all his heart, soul, and might. Um, Yet even then God will not relent on the destruction. And so now, yeah, Jeremiah 11, I'm sorry. Jeremiah 11. I'm still in a different time zone, apparently. Jeremiah 11. I want you to notice what God through Jeremiah says during this era, right? And, and, and Jeremiah is a prophet who basically starts during Josiah's reign and goes all the way through the end here. Jeremiah chapter 11. And I'm going to start reading, I think, oh, let's see. I'm going to start reading about verse, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 6. And listen to what God says to Jeremiah at this point. And maybe now, seeing what we've seen in Kings, we can make better sense of what God says through Jeremiah to this generation. So the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I solemnly warned your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, warning them persistently even to this day, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear. But everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore I brought upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did not. Again, the Lord said to me, a conspiracy exists among the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers. Turned back from what? From Josiah's reforms, right? Here was their, this, 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 this great effort by this great man, this, this great king, God-oriented king. And as soon as he's dead, what do they do? They turn right back. They've turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They've gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, and this is where it starts to get interesting. Behold, oh, there's that word again. I am bringing disaster upon them that they cannot escape. Though they cry to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in time of their trouble either. For your gods have become as many as your cities, O Judah, As many as the streets of Jerusalem are the altars you have set up to shame, altars to make offerings to Baal. Therefore, now he seems to be addressing Jeremiah directly. Therefore, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer on their behalf. For I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their trouble. What right has my beloved in my house when she has done so many vile deeds. Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? Can you then exult? I don't know about you, but that kind of makes my blood run cold a little bit. When God gets to a point when he says, don't pray about it anymore, don't repent about it, I'm just done with it. And you can cry, you can call out, but I'm not going to listen 
And let me ask you something. You know, most of us, I think, we're used to the idea of, you know, God is, God, God is gracious and merciful and, and very, you know, wants to forgive. How can God say this? What's going on here? What's the, what's the right way to kind of split the difference here between, you know, a God who's merciful and loves to forgive versus a God here who says, yeah, you can pray and sacrifice all you want at this point. You can call to me. I'm not going to listen. In fact, Jeremiah, I don't want you praying for him either anymore. What do you do with that? What does that tell us about God that maybe we forget about sometimes? Say again, I heard us. Yeah, he knows their hearts. Say something more about that. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, are they really sorry or they just run out of options? They just run out of options. They're sorry they got caught. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, now that the consequences are here, they're not sorry for the sin. They're sorry the bills come due. And so they're going to call to God here in this desperate moment, and God's going to say, I'm not a fool. <laughs> I know the only reason you're talking to me right now is because you have run out of all other options and all your other gods who you worshiped ahead of me have failed you. And so you've come to the Hail Mary pass, the last ditch possible effort to save your necks. And when you do that, even sacrificial f- flesh won't save you. And look at, in verse 16, look at that last little question. You know, a couple of rhetorical questions there. Can even sacrificial flesh avert your doom? And, but look at that last rhetorical question. That, this one's the quirky one. What do we do with this? Um, oops, if I can find it. Would you then exult? What does he mean by that? But what's the point of that one? That one seems a little out of place, perhaps. What does he mean by that? Can you then exult? I'm sorry, it's verse 15, actually. Okay, how can you praise when you've been so bad? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of it. You know, we, we, uh, you can't really praise a God you don't know or understand. And by the way, part of showing you don't know and understand God is thinking that you can play games with God and he's going to listen to you. God is not a fool who can be manipulated. He knows our hearts. And he knows that we're only coming to him now because not because we love him, care about him, or are truly sorry for our sins. We're sorry we got caught. And so, yeah, I'll exult in the end. Or, or, or what about this other possible way of looking at it as well? When people seem to figure out, and those of us who raise children, we've seen this. One of your children thinks they figured out how to do stuff and get away with it because you always let them off the hook in the end. Do they respect you? Or do they kind of, kind of respect themselves and praise themselves a little bit more? Look how clever I am. I know how to manipulate mom and dad. Or in this case, I know how to manipulate God. God says, I don't do that. It's one of the things that concerns me sometimes about deathbed conversion, so-called. We've all known people who you know, kind of want to get right with God in the last possible minute. And listen, at the end of the day, I'm not God. God will make that determination, but I'll tell you why I get real concerned when people talk to me about, well, you know, someone, you know, that it's, it's, sometimes it's almost the Church of Christ version of the sinner's prayer. You ignore God for, for years of your life, and on your deathbed, and well-meaning brethren are coming by saying, you know, please repent and everything else. And, and, and again, God alone knows the heart, but is somebody on their deathbed in the same place that, that Jerusalem was at in this point where all other options have run out and, it's, and the bill has come due and I'm staring eternity straight in the face? And so now, now at the last possible minute, what will I do? I will cry to God. God says, don't play me for a fool. I know why you're talking to me now on your deathbed. You didn't want to hear me when you were living and, and there were other options to actually use your life for me, to worship me, to praise me, to serve me. Now, can someone truly be sorry on their deathbed, realize the enormity of what they've done? And, and, and yeah, I, I absolutely. But I've lived long enough, and the Bible's old enough, and reminds us, even when God has to say this to Jeremiah, that God knows the score too. And I think there's plenty of people on their deathbeds who are also turning to God because all their other gods have failed them. Why I say this? So we can be judgmental towards other people. No, no. Because you don't want to be one of those people who thinks that God will always be there for you in the last possible minute, who lives your life on your terms until the bill comes due and then thinks you're just going to go running back to God and God says, I don't play that game. And that's hard to hear in an age in which we are so focused on God's grace and mercy and so forth that we, if we're not careful, become people who think we can manipulate God as well. Because I will tell you, in the religious world, a lot of what passes for talk about grace and God's mercy is really ways to manipulate God. It's not the God of the Bible, it's the God of pop culture and pop religion. 
Because if you truly fear God, you will not play games with God. Yeah, Mark. Is that similar to when Jesus talked about in Matthew 12, 31, therefore I'll tell you ever since that blasphemy will be forgiven people, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Yeah, that's start. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm giving you everything you're going to get. That's right. If you're not going to follow me now, there's nothing going to change your mind. You're that's not right. going to follow me. That's right. No, that, that, I think I think I think it's certainly in the same you know area of, of 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 revelation. Yeah, I mean Jesus. I think it's a slightly different nuance, but the same basic principle, which is you get to a point where your heart is so hardened that even when you do turn to God, you can't turn to Him honestly. You turn to Him again, still in a sinful, manipulative way. Um, just like you know, again, you know, Jesus' point there, especially in the Gospels, was like you just said, this is God's last offer. This is all God is going to say. This is the only way God's going to say it to you. And if that's not enough to turn your heart, well. You know, there's only one other there's only one path left open to you, and it's not a pretty one. But those people will usually be self-deceived as about that as well. That that's the other when you get into that the whole concept of the blasphemy or the sin against the Holy Spirit. You know, I've had people over the years ask me, you know, or you know, they'll read that verse and it will not be forgiven, and they get very nervous. And they'll come and they'll ask, you know, I'll say, if if you're worried you've committed it, that's the proof you haven't. <laughs> because if you understand what that is, you know, it's the heart so hardened that nothing in the Bible will really change you from how you are living anymore. If you're worried you've committed that sin and your heart's soft enough still, you haven't yet. It's the person who's doing wrong who even when they read the Bible says, that's not me, or I didn't do that, or, or doesn't, you know, doesn't take the Bible at face value. Um, and because it's ultimately an issue of the heart, God alone only knows when somebody is that far gone. You know, you and I can look at and make educated guesses. I mean, elders have to do that sometimes when you're dealing with members and church discipline and so forth. You can make an educated guess, but God alone knows when somebody's literally that far gone. Just like, again, I would never take away from a, from a full, you know, somebody can, you know, get, you know can, can somebody on their deathbed or at the end, you know, want to be baptized or repent of their sins or, you know, depending on their personal circumstance. Sure, they can, but, you know, but God knows when we basically just run out of time and plan on, on uh you know, trying to jump on the life raft at the last possible minute after we squeezed every last ounce of selfishness out of this life. And, oh, but yeah, and, and go back and you read Jeremiah. That, that's part of the, the language here, absolutely. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. And that's why ultimately, again, you know, and this is where it gets touchy in terms of real life application. You know, God alone knows hearts and God alone will draw those lines. Though, you know, again, do churches sometimes have to make best judgment decisions? Do elders have to make best judgment situations when it comes to, again, church discipline or church membership, stuff like that? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, while, while all of us always remembering, even when we're in those kind of moments, we're still the ultimate judgment belongs to God. Humans don't bat a thousand on this. Um, but, but on the flip side, by the way, for those of us who are a little uncomfortable because we live in a very tolerant age, let's understand this as well. To not judge is a form of judging as well. I mean, God calls us to make these decisions about ourselves most of all, but then it's certainly about the influences we allow into our lives. Uh, let me get Yvette and I'll come over to Scott. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. No, that's that's exactly right, Scott. So that's what's interesting. Yes, you know, the trick is, and, and this is the, this is a trick. You know, the change of heart is only in chapter or is in uh, Chronicles, is in Second Chronicles. And so, yeah, fair point. I wondered if someone would bring this up. Well done. Um, <laughs> but because no, because you're a good Bible student, you knew that. You know. Um, 
consequences. And, and that's the key, and, that, and that's why I think it's important. You know, again, going back to big picture, why was Kings written? Kings was written to explain how did we get here? We blew it, you know, and, and yeah, you, it's all Manasseh's fault, really. That's what the text is saying. No, the text is not saying it's just Manasseh's fault. But, but he led the people, by the way, and that's why leadership matters, because one of the things that Kings emphasizes is while the people follow, most people are followers, and are going to follow what the leadership does. Um, there's always individuals, you know, like the Naboths of the world, but, but by and large, most of us, let's be honest, the Bible got nailed it. We're sheep. We're followers. And so leadership matters. And so, yeah, Manasseh led the people in this. Per, and, and, and I think that's one of the things, though, Scott, that's worth playing with. You know, Kings was to emphasize this is how we got here. And Manasseh pushed us over, even though Manasseh eventually repents. But he couldn't undo what he had done, and especially with the people in their hearts, now he affected them. And again, just like David cannot undo the sin with Bathsheba in his penitence, and God makes clear to him, even though his sin is forgiven, and he will not lose the kingdom the way Saul did, David's sin is going to haunt his house. You know, in all sorts of ways, starting with the sword will never depart from your house, and four of David's children die on natural death, starting with the child conceived in immorality. And then you have Amner, you know, Amnon and Absalom and Abijah eventually. He pays fourfold and four sons. And that's not the only thing. The other, the other thing is this. Where do you think, if you're just you know, watching how our, and again, warning to all of us parents, you know, our sins become our children's sins. Where do you think Solomon learned to love lots of women? Because who was doing it first? David. Even outside of Bathsheba, did David have just one wife? No. No, he had a household. In fact, part of the whole reason Absalom, in his rebellion against David, could assert his rule in his father's place was he could take all of David's wives, plural, on the roof of the palace, put a tent up, and, you know, and take them sexually before all of Israel to assert his, he's replaced his dad. Because David had lots of wives. So where does Solomon get the idea that collecting women's a good idea? Well, because daddy had a little, you know, Dad had a little secret habit on the side, so to speak. Our children know, our children watch, our children absorb, and our children will take it further than we ever did. Boy, is that a lesson over and over again in Scripture. But yeah, so the Manasseh's point, you know, he launched something he could not put, he could not put the genie back in the bottle. Personally might be able to repent in a way that God recognized. But, uh, and how do you live with that, man? <laughs> how do you live with that? Um, so, yeah, good. Anything else? Anyone else? As we march on towards in here? Yes, ma'am, Nancy. Um, I may be wrong about this, so you, you will know better than I know. But, uh oh. Uh, I, had, I had a sense that Manasseh, when he's terrible at raising his son, because <laughs> Amnon, yeah, comes on. God allows him to come back humble and knowing that only God could save him. Yeah. I think he has just, a ten, you know, five or six years. Hold the grandson in his lap. Yeah. Who will become king when he's eight years old. And <laughs> yeah. Heard the story from grandpa. Yeah. About only God could save me. Yeah. And that may be one reason why God allowed him to come back. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Not, uh, not just I. Oh, I want you to be happy before you die. <laughs> right. I, right. You know, I've got a really serious use for you. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And that, and, that, and that is certainly a possible, possible scenario. I left my Bible somewhere there. <laughs> Set it down and walked off. That's good, Nancy. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else before we move on a little bit? All right. All right. Um, so again, as we kind of press on towards the end here, uh, I'm going to go down, um, get back in Kings here. Um, I'm going to chapter, uh, I wrote down chapter 28, but that can't be right. I think it's chapter 25. Because... Second Kings doesn't have a 28. I think it's 25 is where I want to be next, at the very end of the book. Yep, that's where I want to be. Chapter 25, okay. So now we come to the end of the book. Um, all that we've talked about is, is understood, implied at this point. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar, in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it, so the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. Now do the math real quick. 
How long is that siege? And you don't have to get down to month and day, but just ninth year, 11th year, how long is that siege? A couple of years. That's a long time not to go to the grocery store. It's a long time not to be able to plant and harvest. It's a long time not to be able to you know, replace your clothes or get more uh, building materials to patch your leaky roof, etc. They're shut up in the city for a couple of years. We don't appreciate the horrors of ancient siege warfare. But by the way, now that also that starts to make some of the other stories that we've read and talked about make sense. Like, you know, when, when in the days of one of the Assyrian sieges, you know, dove's dung was selling for exorbitant amounts of money. Now you begin to understand how that happens because you are shut up for months and even years in this city. And by the way, that's also why one of the other things, and now that also helps make more sense, one of the other uh, things that almost always in biblical passages shows up in times of war, i.e. siege, is not just death by the sword, but pestilence or disease. Because you shut a bunch of people up in very closed quarters with no hygiene, sanitation, limited fresh water, no real sewage system of what's going to happen. Yeah, you see those pictures of Cat Lady with her 500 cats in her small apartment? Yeah, think that. And that's what the city becomes. No food, stench, overwhelming. And by the way, what was the solution per Jeremiah? What was the solution at any point during this siege? What was the solution? You didn't have to live like this. You're not going to keep the land and you're not going to keep Jerusalem no matter what. But you don't have to live like this. The consequences are here. No escape in that. But you don't have to live and die like this. You can put down the sword, humble yourself, accept the consequences of your sin, and live. Nah, they don't do that. Even then, here at the end, they're rebellious. And so on the ninth day, verse 3 of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's guard, and the Chaldeans were around the city, and they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, overtook him in the plains of Jericho. Why does it matter it happens there? Again, remember, Bible narrative is generally sparse on details. If a detail's given, it probably matters, or you meant to kind of say, hmm, that's, that's, that's interesting, let's connect the dots. Why does it matter that's where he was running and that's where he was caught? Say again? Okay, so it's certainly a place of battle and in particular, I'm sorry, and defeat. And there's one other reason too. That's where their story in the land started. What was the first city they took when God gave them the land? And now we've come full circle. And it's not the nations fleeing from them. Remember what Rahab says to the spies back in the book of Joshua? We've heard about your God. We've heard about what happened in Egypt. We're afraid of you. Now who's running and who's chasing? And where is he caught? Where the story started. And all his army was scattered from him. And they captured the king, and they brought him up to the Bab king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. And they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound them in chains, and took him to Babylon. And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, in all the houses of Jerusalem, every great house he burned down. Why does that matter? Why do I need to know blow by blows of how Jerusalem is raised? Why does that matter? How did first kings begin? Building and building what? The temple and the king's palace. Remember, again, we always focus on Solomon being the temple builder, and he was, but already, remember, we talked about this way back months ago, go back in your memory, when Solomon did not just build the temple, one of the first warning signs that all was not well with Solomon in Kings is the fact that he also built the king's house. How long did it take him to build the temple, though? It took him seven years, a very divine number, very appropriate number. He probably did that on purpose. I would. But how long did he spend building his own house? 
Yeah, I think, I think it was 13, but yeah, 13, 14. But bottom line is essentially double. Oh, it's come full circle now. And you want to talk about vanity of vanities, all is vanity? We end the book with what Solomon built being destroyed. The weaknesses that he in some ways brought into the nation. Who brings in earnest the worship of false gods? And understand me about this. Here's the thing. One of the things the prophets have been clear, especially the minor prophets, you go back and read them. God knows that his people have always been idolatrous. They have always worshiped other gods. And one of the minor prophets, I think it was Amos off the top of my head. I can't remember for sure, but I think it's Amos. Amos says, I know that even in the wilderness, I knew you had idols hidden in your tent even then. Even before you ever got to land, I knew you snuck some out from Egypt with you. I knew you were worshiping them in your tents in secret. I know you have always been idolatrous. But here's the difference when you get to kings. Now it's public policy. Make sense? There's a world of difference in what people do on their own in their individual sinfulness and rebellion against God. It's a whole different issue when a government or a nation says, I approve this. That's what we're going to be. We're going to build temples and we're going to build high places and we're going to worship these gods as we intermarry with all these foreign women. There's a world of difference in, because that's, by the way, sometimes when people say, well, you know, the culture's always been bad. Yes, the culture's always been bad. But when a nation, as nation, begins to make these depravities its policy, that's a whole different issue. And again, you've heard me say it before, but just for the sake of those that are teaching our children, what our children have to learn from us moms and dads is that never has a nation pushed God the way this nation is pushing right now when it comes to man and woman and gender. No, no one has. Oh, there's always been homosexuality and depression. Yeah, there always has been, absolutely. These things have been done before. But a nation that says there's no man and woman, nah, that's a new one. Even the pagans didn't do this. Let's use the language of kings. Even the Amorites didn't go that far. And so we need to be becoming more uncomfortable by the day that we are living in Babylon in that we are not what we need to be. And we, moms and dads, we've got to get this across to our kids. You're going to have to serve God above all else, and it's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge. And a lot of people are going to not understand why you won't agree with them and celebrate. I mean, hey, guess what comes this week? It's June. Guess what? I'm already starting to see you lie around a lot. I sat on an airplane yesterday, and next to me was a young lady sitting there with her little squishmallow octopus thing, and it was rainbow-colored, and it had pride on it. Uh, poor young lady, captive to a mindset she doesn't even fully understand, caught in the snare of the devil. A, a young person who's grown up in a generation that thinks this is normal. And so again, moms and dads, don't underestimate the ability of the culture to capture your kids on this. All right, I've said enough about that. Um, but point stands. So the temple and the house of the king are destroyed. All is undone. The book ends in disaster. We're back in Jericho. Nothing to show. Nothing to show for a thousand years in the land. Think about that. How long has it been since Moses? Rounding off a thousand years. Nothing to show for a thousand years in the land. It's a tragedy is what it is. And it's a warning. You know, what's the New Testament equivalent of this? I think the New Testament equivalent of this is the seven letters to the churches of Asia. I mean, you know, there's certainly, a, you can read 1 Corinthians. I like to call 1 Corinthians the book of how not to do church. Um, because if, if you, all the different ways you can mess up a congregation, Corinthians probably explored it at some point. But really, you know, sometimes if you haven't done that lately, go read the letters to the seven churches of Asia. It's sobering. Because even more so there, again, God, and it's really Jesus, the glorified Jesus, the husband of the, of the bride, his church, who's warning these different Christians in these different congregations about things that are shockingly contemporary if we, if we think about it. And, uh, and so again, how do we keep our own story from not becoming a tragedy? Well, I think it's for all of us to, to think about and meditate upon. All right, comments, questions, objections, refutations, disagreements, rebukes, cordial or otherwise. Now, I always takes the air out of the room. Nothing? Really? End of the quarter, last chance? All right, then. Going once? Because once I start talking, you're in trouble. Uh, yeah, first, okay, Stan, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's right. I mean, you know, one of the things about getting older is you, you watch churches go through life cycles. And you are, I mean, you know, all of us who are past a certain age can think about, you know, even if we don't live where we grew up anymore, congregations that were known and well-known when we were young people that either don't exist today or are a shell of what they were. Um, just like Ephesus in the New Testament. That's the thing I think that captures why Ephesus captures so many of us, our, our minds on this in the New Testament. You've got the book of Ephesians when Paul's alive and doing what he does. And then you get John, you know, after Paul's probably been dead 30 years, give or take, depending on how you want to date some things, but you know, maybe three decades later. So you're talking about the children and grandchildren of the Ephesians that Paul's writing to. And Paul says, or Jesus says to that church, you're about to lose your candlestick. You're about to lose your lampstand. You've, you've left your first love. Um, it, it's so hard to pass the faith on from generation to generation. That's part of my takeaway. Is, is, again, as a parent who thinks a lot about these things at, at my stage of life, um, it is a real challenge to pass it on. Again, and not just like going through the motions faith, because that was, you know, that was not, the problem with Ephesus was not, you know, rank idolatry and, you know, just fornication in every pew. And no, it was just literally, they were, they were just going through the motions. You, you, your heart's not in it anymore, and I know that. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I appreciate that. Yeah. Somebody else? I see the snickering back there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, Je- Jeff and I, for those of you who don't know, Jeff and I go, go way back. We love each other anyways. Um, yeah, we were kids together way back in Tampa, Florida. Yes, and the, the building that we obeyed the gospel in is now a pawn shop in a very difficult part of town. <laughs> so, yeah, very good. Yeah, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, and that's thing in the Bible. You know, it's, it's, uh, I have a preacher friend who calls it the third and fourth generation problem because it is a pattern you see in the Bible, where you know, very devout parents and maybe somewhat devout children, and by grandchildren or beyond, it's it's all falling apart. Which, by the way, it's not just true in religion. Remember, the, some of you remember the old story. You know, whether it's true or not, it ought to be true. Um, Benjamin Franklin after the Constitutional Convention. You know, what kind of government do we have, Doctor Franklin? And anybody remember the the legendary answer that Ben Franklin gave to the question, "What kind of government do we have?" A republic, if you can keep it. You know, some of you have ever heard that story? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Too, too many Hebrew names. It's a, it's a foreign language to us, right? It's a foreign language. <laughs> yeah, Jezreel, yes, that, that's where Josiah died. Yeah, and he's on the brain anyways. He, he died there by Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley. So, um, oh, man. All right, well, last, last thing, um, and actually, I don't have time to look at this in the text. You can look at this in the text later um, in, in, the, in the book of Kings, but um, there's a line in Isaiah. Um, I'm in Isaiah chapter 57. This is where we'll end, uh, and this has to do with Josiah. So, you go back and you read the part of Josiah in the Kings. Um, you know, again, God makes clear to Josiah, you know, very impressed with your repentance and, you know, and, and, and really appreciate everything you've done. Yet, I'm not going to change my mind about destroying you because, destroying the, 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 the city and the nation because of the sins of Manasseh. But it won't happen during your days. And then what happens in the very next little episode in Kings? Josiah dies. And you do the math and he's probably only about, and I haven't done the math in a while, but my memory tells me last time I read this in, 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 in that detail and thought it through, uh, about 39 or 40 years old, relatively young. You say he reigned a long time, yeah, but when you start when you're eight, it's not hard to get the you know, 30-year reign quickly. Um, he died about 39 or 40. Why would God allow such a good man to die young? Why didn't he protect him in battle? Isaiah chapter 57 Beginning in verse 1. I, I, I don't, God alone knows, by the way. Let me be very clear. God alone knows his purposes. But again, does God give hints about how he thinks about things? Yeah, he does in the Bible. He does. God alone knows his specific purpose. But, but I wonder, because of something he says here in Isaiah 57, he says this. He says, the righteous man perishes. No one lays it to heart. You know, the world doesn't care when righteous people die because we're nobodies to the world. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. For the righteous man is taken away from calamity. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. Now that's a different perspective on why God allows the righteous to die young sometimes. We look at it as a tragedy. But for somebody who is God's person, their death doesn't lead to further troubles in this world. What does it lead to? 
rest in peace. If God's already determined that he's going to destroy the people no matter what now, why give Josiah another 20, 30 years in this world when this world is passing away anyways? Yeah, Josiah, you've proved your point. You're my guy. You're a Deuteronomy 6 guy. You've proved your point. But you know what? I've got other things I've got to get onto in history. I'll take you to be with me. And so we look at it as a tragedy. How could God let that happen? God says, ah, from my perspective, I gave him rest. <laughs> the people aren't going to listen anyways. They're not going to change their hearts. I gave him rest. Boy, do we look at things the wrong way sometimes. And so the challenge to learn to think God's thoughts after him, see the world the way he does, and live the way he would ask us to do. Thanks for, thanks for spending the quarter with me and with Randy, uh, making our way through this book. And uh, we'll be adjourned. Oh, let's end with a word of prayer. Let's end with a word of prayer. Will you bow with me? Good God, thanks for today. Thanks for letting us worship you, the privilege of being your people in this place, calling upon your name, singing your praises, commemorating the death of your son. Father, may each of us tremble at your word and take to heart uh, the sobering lessons that Kings provides. May we be people of Deuteronomy 6. May we love you with every fiber and aspect of our beings uh, so that we will be the kind of people who will be salt and light in a fallen and dying world. May we be the agents of your purposes in this place. May we teach our children to do the same. And may all be done for your glory in Jesus' praise. It's in his name we offer this prayer. Amen.